we know that when children experience maltreatment by a caregiver, um, that is the one person in the world that you're supposed to trust more than anybody. And if you experience abuse by that person, then it becomes more and more difficult to trust people growing up and to form those healthy attachment relationships. I, I, I'm on a quest to help religious leaders learn the science of ACEs, learn the science of urban ACEs, learn the science of neuroscience, learn the science of trauma, because when, you know, often we get into a language barrier that prevents us from being partners with each other. Like another you know, way to support children is having community involvement. And like you said, whether that is their religious support, whether it's their community, you know, activities, but being able to belong to some supportive community um, is really what we can do to help help children. Hi, everybody. My name is Pete Singer. I'm the executive director here at Grace. We started by watching a video. Oh, hang on. Now I've got another video playing. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. You got to love technical difficulties, right? Um, anyway, uh, we showed that video because it's just such a, a powerful reminder of why we have these conversations, that there are kids, that there are adults who've experienced different forms of abuse that are impact and that are carrying a weight. And we have a responsibility to care for kids, to care for others who might be vulnerable, 
and to help people along the journey as as they work through some of the things that that may have happened as they try and make sense and figure out how that relates to who uh, who I am, how I relate to the world around me, uh, how I even understand God, and and I love how that video uh, helps us recognize that there's real people behind this, real kids, real adults that that are hurting. And so our hope today, as we have this conversation, is that we'll leave today better equipped to be there for kids, to be there for adults who might be hurting, that we'll leave better equipped to support kids and families, that we'll leave better equipped to, to know what to do if we hear about something happening. So that really is the goal and the desire for today. As I mentioned, my name is Pete Singer. I'm the executive director over here at Grace. And today we are talking about physical abuse and emotional or psychological abuse. Two forms of abuse uh, impacting uh, in our conversation today, looking at how they impact kids. This is part of a series um, that is starting with looking at different types of child abuse, and then we'll be looking at different forms of abuse that may impact adults, such as clergy sexual abuse, intimate partner violence, um, and the like. So I'm glad that you could join us as we head into this uh, series. Please uh, be aware that next month we'll be talking about polyvictimization which is just a recognition that so often when a person experiences one form of abuse, it's very likely that there's another form of abuse happening as well. That it, it's common that there isn't just one type of abuse impacting a child. And so when you learn of a child experiencing one type of abuse, even if you might be thinking, well, that doesn't seem too significant, that doesn't seem too huge to remember that often what we see is one type of the many types of abuse that a person may be experiencing. And so that does encourage us and prompt us to act. As we have our discussion today, please feel free to put any questions that you might have in the Q&A tab there. We'll uh, have a period of time at the end where we can talk about those and try and answer some of those questions. Please also feel free to put comments in the in the chat. Um, again, we really appreciate you all being here today. And I also really want to extend a huge thank you to Rebecca, to Shelly, to Daryl for joining us today and for really sharing your wisdom and your insight and your experiences with us. We're honored to have the three of you here as just incredible experts and people who are passionate about this, not doing it because it's a job that you happen to be able to get, but because it really resonates with who you are. So thank you very much uh, for being here. If you all could uh, introduce yourselves, let us know a little bit about your, your background. Daryl, if you wanna get us started and then uh, Rebecca and Shelley. Absolutely. Um, Pete, thank you. Thank you um, and, and Zane and Grace for um, the grace, no pun intended, for the grace extended to uh, Rebecca and Shelley and all of us who are here today and, and have been on your program. This is an incredible series and, and you and your board ought to be commended for the great work that you're doing. So thank you for the invitation. Um, I am a in my 23rd year of serving a congregation, an urban congregation in the capital city of the state of New Jersey. Uh, the Shallow Baptist Church is the oldest Black Baptist church in the city of Trenton. Um, 1880, it was founded. So we're celebrating, 100, just celebrated 142 years. And in the last 118 years, I'm only the third pastor to serve this congregation. So uh, my predecessor served 53 years and his predecessor served 40 six years, 42 years. Uh, so in 95 years, they only had two pastors. So my contract reads, I have to stay another 30 plus years uh, before <laughs> I, I can be let go. Um, and so I am a pastor. I, I, I heard a call. Um, and I answered that call when I was in my going to my senior year in college at Stanford University. And I've been following that call um, ever since I was 22 years old. Um, so the congregation is a wonderful urban congregation set in the heart of the city. Um, it's an 80,000 uh, 
uh, person city, but it has all the social challenges that a Southeast um, DC or South Central Los Angeles or South Side Chicago bring. So I'm committed to the um, care and well-being mentally, spiritually, and physically of God's people, both it, at our church, but also in the city of Trenton. So um, that's my heart, and that's where God has me. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yes, I want to also extend my thanks for having us join another event. Shelly and I are all, always happy to, to do that and to be here with, with you and all of you listeners today. So my name is Rebecca Full. I am the program coordinator for the Otto Bremer Trust Center for Safe and Healthy Children. We are a child maltreatment program uh, located in uh, Minnesota. We are at Masonic Children's Hospital, which is in Minneapolis. Um, I wish I could show you all outside my window. It is definitely a winter day in Minnesota, but we all made it here safe and sound and, um, and are doing well. My background is as a social worker. I'm a licensed independent clinical social worker. I have spent my entire 20 plus years um, as a social worker working with children and families who have been impacted by any form of family violence. Um, I've worked in, in different environments, but they all sort of take me to the same place, which is um, working with this population of individuals who really need um, us to, to be involved to make sure that we can create um, a safe community for, for them and their entire family system. So I'm happy to be here today and, and share some of our insight with you. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for tuning in and thank you, Pete, for having us. My name is Shelly Magnuson. I'm a certified child life specialist and I have been working with children and families for well over 20 years. Um, primarily, when I first started my career, I was working with children in medical se settings, helping them cope with uh, medical procedures, helping them understand the medical processes processes um, and identifying coping strategies that they could use in those situations. Uh, in the last three years, uh, almost three years, I've come over to our Center for Safe and Healthy Children with Rebecca, and now I'm working specifically with children who have encountered maltreatment and then helping them understand what to expect when they come to our clinic for a medical exam and then also finding resources that we can um, introduce them to that might help them cope or might help them process some of their experiences until they get um, into therapy. All right. Thank you very much for sharing a little bit about who you are and also a little bit of who you are today with us. Um, we really, really uh, appreciate that and are grateful for it. So as we get into this conversation about physical abuse and emotional or psychological abuse, um, can we even just start out by helping to, to define what are we talking about? What is physical abuse? What is emotional or psychological abuse? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's always important to make sure that we have those shared working definitions. Um, so I'll start by talking a little bit about physical abuse. Um, and, you know, essentially at the core, um, physical abuse is talking about that intentional, causing intentional bodily injury to another person. And, you know, we're in Minnesota, every state across the country is going to have their own definition that is used for state statute in terms of um, you know, whether or not child protection would get involved, whether or not there would be criminal prosecution. I'm going to talk about it a little bit from the Minnesota perspective, um, and just keep in mind that there could be slight variations depending on uh, what the state statutes are for where you live uh, specifically. But for us here, physical abuse can be sort of any form of causing an injury or lasting pain to a child that can't reasonably be explained by a child's history provided of being an accident. So this could include throwing a child, kicking a child, burning, biting, choking, punching, anything that causes that physical pain and injury. Per Minnesota state statute, physical abuse does not include physical discipline, which does not result in an injury. Um, so I just like to, to 
make sure that people know that, that that is part of the state statute that is excluded. Um, that being said, those of us who work in this field um, do feel strongly um, that physical um, discipline um, can also at times really fall under that same umbrella as physical abuse. Um, and I'm happy to, to certainly talk about that as we move forward today as well. Um, emotional abuse um, is the second one I just wanted to talk about. Um, what we refer to um, in Minnesota, we, we kind of call that mental injury. So call, causing mental injury to a child. And that's really causing that substantial and observable injury to a child's psychological capacity or emotional stability. This could be demonstrated by a substantial and observable effect in a child's behavior, their emotional response, or their cognition. So for example, they might have thoughts of self-harm, thoughts of suicide. You might see aggression, withdraw, isolation, a decline in school performance, all of those things that can be sort of uh, tied back um, to um, experiences they had that injured their psychological or mental capacity. All right. Thanks for helping us understand what what we're talking about. And like you said, it's important to have those shared uh, those shared definitions. Daryl and Shelley, any any other thoughts related to what does comprise physical abuse, psychological, emotional abuse? All right. Shelley. I think Rebecca um, answered a lot of that. Great, great. So one of the things we have to ask ourselves, I mean, I think just in my head, um, it, it makes pretty clear sense. Um, don't physically abuse a kid. That would not be something that seems to me like a good idea. Um, but even going beyond that, we recognize, and I think that video highlighted some, it's not just that it's a bad thing to do, it's that it actually has a big impact on kids who experience this type of abuse, whether it's physical abuse or emotional abuse. There are significant impacts. Shelly, can you help us understand some what those effects are on a child. And then also, uh, can you fill us in, do any of those impacts carry over with the child into adulthood? Uh, definitely. Um, and I like to even just back up a little bit and when we're working with children, like what are their signals? Um, and so if I could, Pete, I would just like to talk about maybe some physical symptoms of what sure. stress looks like in, uh, especially in young children. Um, we might see complaining of headaches, belly aches, um, changes in sleep patterns, changing in eating patterns, um, even children who um, might have wedding accidents, um, having shaking or nervous behavior. And I, um, those are signs of stress in young children because they're, they don't have the skills to say, wow, I'm really feeling stressed out these days, but these would be flags that would maybe pop up that would make us tune in and look a little more closely. Um, I think when we talk about the impact, um, there's a lot of overlap between how children behave because they've experienced trauma or maltreatment and how children might look if they have like ADHD. And so how do we differentiate that? Because there is a lot of overlap. Um, and I was talking to Rebecca earlier because we've had presentations um, in our department about this and our um, medical director, Dr. Nancy Harper had pulled together some information that I was gonna share um, from a study by Siegfried and Blackshear um, about this overlap between trauma and ADHD. And so you might see a child who's just never paying attention. That could be trauma, that could be ADHD. And there's other things like being easily distracted, that child who's never paying attention, why aren't, why aren't they able to focus on this, these things that we're talking about? Um, and then they might just seem super disorganized or, rest, or restless. And so um, when you look at these things, it's not, we can't give children who are exhibiting these behaviors 
like a medication like you would a child who's experiencing ADHD because the medication isn't going to help if the underlying cause is trauma. And so I think I just wanted to bring that to the forefront of, yes, these are impacts on children. They're having difficulty in school. They're having difficulty sleeping. Um, there might be intrusive thoughts, hyper, hyper arousal. Um, or avoidant behavior, negative moods. So all of these things um, can affect the children and then obviously it would bring into the school, it would affect their learning. And so the impact on that um, certainly can be lifelong. Wow, yeah, that's huge. I know I've, I've talked with a lot of schools around just um, recognizing that as you're describing that the impact of trauma or abuse for a child often if you just just look at the surface, you're thinking, oh, ADHD. Mm -hmm. oh, wait, let's stop a moment and, and ask a few more questions. Let's dig a little deeper and, and we find out um, that there's something else going on, which is certainly not to say that anyone who looks like they might have ADHD has been abused. Of course not. Correct. But, um, but it, it does call us to look a little bit more deeply and, and ask questions out of love and care. Correct. Yes. Yeah, and I, I can speak to a little bit if you'd like just um, just to kind of touch on that this these um, impact children, of course, but then what we see is that it impacts children as they grow into adolescence and adulthood. One thing we know about trauma is that it has an impact on individuals differently at different developmental stages. So you have younger children who might exhibit certain signs. They might be doing just fine um, at one age and then give them six months, a year, two years. They've gone into a different developmental stage and you're starting to see other signs. And we know that trauma experienced in childhood does impact children, adolescents, and adults. So what are some of the things that we see? We certainly see lower self-esteem. Um, one of the big things we see is difficulty forming, trusting, loving, healthy relationships. Um, we know that when children experience maltreatment by a caregiver, um, that is the one person in the world that you're supposed to trust more than anybody. And if you experience abuse by that person, then it becomes more and more difficult to trust people growing up and to form those healthy attachment relationships. We know that adults who have experienced trauma often have mental health issues. Um, we see an increase in depression, anxiety, uh, suicide, suicide attempts. Um, we see substance use issues. Um, and we actually also see long-term health issues. Um, so diabetes, obesity, other medical issues that are resulting from experiencing trauma as a child. Um, and then we also see that sort of generational issue where they might grow up to experience um, either victimization or perpetration, but there is some kind of likelihood that there will be violence also in their life as an adult. So clearly, um, this childhood maltreatment has a huge impact, and it's something that we need to be addressing right away. Yeah. And, and if I can add, Pete, just, mm -hmm. just the notion that, um, you know, adverse childhood experiences, those things that happen to us in childhood, uh, we mask and cope with those adversities in a different way, um, depending on race, background, socioeconomic status, religion. Um, and the masking and the coping tends to bury the pain. So what we experience in childhood, particularly when 80% of our brain was formed between birth and three, when all of our synaptic connections were being formed, some of that stuff is encoded subconsciously, that toxic stress, that, that pain. And if we don't deal with it, one of my kind of pastoral sayings is if you don't deal with your stuff, your stuff will deal with you eventually. Mm -hmm. And that's what we saw in the famous ACE study by Dr. Um, Filetti and Dr. Anda. Um, here were 17,000 predominantly white, predominantly insured, predominantly suburban um, folk who were in a, a obesity clinic. And so they were there for one purpose, to look at 
health and eating and obesity. And it turns out to reduce the study to its bare minimum, they were overeating because they were masking and coping with pain that happened to them in their childhood. So if we don't deal with our childhood adversities, our childhood adversities will deal with us as adults. It will come out. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering, Daryl, what your perspective too is as, as a pastor, right? Because a lot of times people will talk about uh, the health impacts or the emotional impacts that abuse might have uh, on, on a child or even an, a, an adult that experiences abuse. Yeah. But there's also this profound spiritual impact. How have you seen that show up? in your work as a, as a pastor? What, what, what do you do about that spiritual impact as a pastor? Well, you know, as a former, as a survivor, I should say, of childhood adversity, displacement, um, foster care, kinship care from the time I was five until I quote unquote emancipated out of the system in, in, in South Central Los Angeles when I was 18, um, there is the reality of blaming. And, and many folk will then shoot that blame or, or target that blame towards the divine, towards God. Um, why did God let this happen to me? Or why didn't God prevent this from happening to me? Why didn't God stop my mother from doing this? Why did God allow my dad to do this? And you can fill in the dots, the this, right? Whether it's child sexual assault, whether it's physical abuse, um, some of it might be inadvertent, uh, neglect, poverty issues. Um, and so the question of why in a spiritual context is a major issue that I've dealt with from every religious community, from yeah. conservative evangelicals to um, Black, you know, progressives, um, to our Asian American brothers and sisters, to our Native indigenous folk. Um, this issue of why, and, and then the larger issue of race and ethnicity, you know, talking about intergenerational, intragenerational, um, you know, I, I often say there's another name for ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, could also be interpreted as adverse colonial experiences or adverse community experiences. And so all these experiences kind of, if you're a religious person, uh, trace their back way back to what why did where was god when this was happening did god allow this to happen the issue of job um often comes a just man who lost everything um and so this you know the, theologically we are trained to talk about this as theodicy why do why does bad why do bad things happen to good people and and this becomes the careful almost surgical need um, for pastors to acknowledge the pain of those who are in this space, to not easily dismiss them, but to really walk with them so that their crises of faith can be a crisis uh, opportunity for triumph, turning tragedy and trauma into triumph and transcendence. Wow. I love how you describe that that surgical approach, that individualized approach. You can't just say, oh, Here's theology, boom, deal with it. But yep. it really has to be where are you as an individual at? Yep. And, that's, and then you walk alongside. I love that you walk alongside. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Yep. Said, where are a good you counselor. At? Yeah, absolutely. I love it. Thanks, Daryl. Um, so there is this impact. We know that it happens. We know that it has an impact on so many facets of a child's life on into adulthood. Knowing this, we have to act. We, we can't just ignore that. We have to do something about it. What can we do about it? How can we be a safe place? How can we use our voices to create safer places for kids? Daryl, I know you've done some, uh, quite a bit of work uh, around that. I know we all have, but Daryl, I know you have done some specific work too. Yeah, Pete, um, you know, the, the ACE questionnaire often gets the focus as risk factors, right? And part of the work is helping to lift up protective factors, um, mm -hmm. promotive factors, helping to lift up 
prevention and going upstream. And so we often focus on the harm, um, but what about solution? One of the things that I didn't get enough of in seminary in my clinical pastoral education and training was um, systems therapy, family systems work, clinical work. So I went back to school and got a post-master's in marriage and family therapy. And there I came across something I thought was quite theological and spiritual, and that's solution-focused therapy. Hmm. Right? Solution-focused therapy says what starts with the magic question: like, what if this had never happened? What would life be like? And how do we get folk to get unstuck from the tragedy and envision? Um, the possibility. And 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 again, I, I, I want to be careful about getting unstuck. That's not as easy as it sounds. But one of the things we've helped folk to understand that for every ACE questionnaire I give out to members of our congregation now, I also give out a resilience questionnaire. Yeah. Like, what, what are your strengths? How do you overcome? Uh, so I don't want to just leave you with what's wrong with you, um, right, Oprah Winfrey and Bruce, Dr. Bruce Perry, um, in the neurosequential model, say, you know, they 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 wrote a co-wrote a book recently, and most of us have, have referenced, if not read it, what happened to you? So we we often start with the wrong question: What's wrong with that boy? What's wrong with that girl? And and their statement, and I believe it wholeheartedly, is: Don't ask that question. Don't ask what's wrong with you. Ask what happened to you. And in asking what happened to you, it affirms the individual. It says to them that some of this, if not all of it, wasn't even your fault. Yeah. And so if I, if I, so we, we've done basic things like given ACE um, questionnaires in Bible study. I've done Bible mm -hmm. studies on ACEs. I, 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 all my deacons and, and church leaders know their ACE score. I love it. And in knowing their ACE score, I also wanted them to know their resilience score. And in knowing their ACE and resilience score, then we can begin a conversation about healing from trauma and looking at what are promotive and protective factors. Um, you know, epigenetics is the fancy, you know, uh, technical term for how the brain might rebuild itself or get beyond its tragedy. And, and um, I love when I hear a neuroscientist talk about our brains can rebound and rebuild. Um, so for connections that are broken because of trauma, with the right approach and the right counseling, um, and in this case, from a spiritual point of view, um, affirmation, be slow to, slow to speak, quick to listen, listening skills, affirmation skills. Uh, um, a counselor never tells people what to do. He or she helps them get to a, arrive at a destination on their own, and we're just kind of roll map to help them move through and to. And so we've tried to do these innovative approaches, or not even innovative, basic approaches in our congregation. How do we take the research and move it, superimpose it into religious spiritual settings? Uh -huh. That's great. Rebecca Shelley, other thoughts on on what um, we can do to create safe communities and and to strengthen, as Daryl was talking about, those positive childhood experiences, those protective childhood experiences. Yeah, I think the the most important thing to remember is that kids do well when they have at least one really mm -hmm. healthy, important adult that they can build a a strong, healthy attachment with. And so in whatever capacity you can, um, try to build those healthy relationships with, with our youth. Um, be that safe person for them. Be that person they can go to and they can trust. Um, listen to them. Um, believe them if they tell you something has happened to them. Um, praise them for all the wonderful attributes that they have. Um, read to them. Play with them. Interact with them. Be that strong source of support that our kiddos need. I think that's the biggest thing that I would recommend. Um, we know in our clinic that the kids who come see us have experienced maltreatment. Uh, so what we do with them is we actually screen them for symptoms of trauma. So every kiddo that comes here between the age of six and 18, we screen for childhood traumatic stress symptoms. And then, and I'll let Shelly talk about this a little bit, we provide them with some strategy or intervention that they can use 
to address whatever symptom of childhood traumatic stress they're experiencing. And I think just giving them that one strategy um, can really, really help them. And they know that they can come to you for that help and support. And I'll let Shelly kind of talk about that a little bit more as well. Oh, definitely. Um, yeah, we even, um, because of the trauma screening, can break it down into categories and identify where the child might be struggling. And if it is a sleep disturbance, um, then let's talk about some healthy sleep habits. Um, we might address like how much screen time they have at the end of the day, um, setting up relaxing activities, like maybe doing 10 minutes of journaling, using some aromatherapy, uh, listening to some nature sounds as they're falling asleep and giving them some healthy sleep tips um, to try to promote better sleep because we know when children have sleep disturbances, it's not only helping them fall asleep, but then helping them stay asleep. Um, and so when we talk about journaling too, we talk about, well, maybe you can get those thoughts that were in your head out of your head and you concretely are writing them in a journal um, and giving them that their body that physical message that those thoughts can then be put aside. Um, we have other strategies such as biofeedback, little stickers that we like can use with them to help them uh, practice some deep breathing and getting the oxygen into their bodies and how how many breaths does it take to get your body warmed up and physically relaxed. And so teaching them strategies about learning how to monitor that um, can help with some of this hyper arousal or intrusive thoughts. Um, and then we even, um, we'll talk about like some grounding activities. Uh, there's one called 54321 where you identify five things that you can see and four things that you can hear and I'm going to mess this up, but it's uh, mm -hmm. three things you can touch, uh, two things you can smell, and one thing you can taste. And allowing the child to recognize, well, you might not be able to do that if you stay in one spot. So can you move around your house? Can you move around your environment? And now you are getting grounded in those spaces. Um, but I think to piggyback, too, on what Rebecca was saying about healthy relationships, we also talk to families um, and say um, some of the things they're already doing are these positive childhood experiences. They're providing consistency, structure. Their child knows when they come home from school, they're gonna have dinner. They know that a caregiver is going to be there. They know that they're gonna be able to go to bed and sleep in the same spot every night. And just meeting some of those basic needs are things that promote and can buffer those adverse childhood experiences. So when we talk to families, you know, we can remind them that they're already doing a lot of these things. Yeah, make sure they know what they're doing well. Daryl, you're going to say something? Yeah, just, just quickly, you know, a, a part of this um, challenge is, is simply about educating yourself and oneself on what's out there, right? Uh, we, we can't be afraid of research and data and evidence. Um, you know, the, the late Peter Benson, Dr. Peter Benson, who founded the Search Institute, um, the 40 developmental assets of positive um, youth development, right? Asset number 19, Peter, I love saying this, is any child who spends two to three hours a week in religious activities will fare better. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we should not be afraid to yes. say that. that. That affirms church, right? That affirms, but it also affirms synagogue. It affirms mosque. It affirms temple. It affirms what we do Friday, Saturday, and Sunday as complement to what happens from a social service point of view, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday during the day. Um, and and so, you know, our, I, I'm on a quest to help religious leaders learn the science of ACES, learn the science of urban ACES, learn the science of neuroscience, learn the science of trauma, because when, you know, often we get into a language barrier that prevents us 
from being partners with each other. So those in the faith community see research and science somehow as um, I, I, you know oppositional to their positions of faith. And I would say they're complementary, right? We may call the same thing we do by different names. For example, the five promotive and protective factors, concrete supports in time of need, um, knowledge, you know, resilience, and knowledge of parenting, um, uh, you know, a couple of others. You know, I always use the one about concrete supports in time of need. 20 years ago, before I got immersed in the science, if someone came up to me, do you provide concrete supports in time of need to <laughs> members in your church? And I would say, hmm, let me think about that. But if they had come up to me and said, do you provide benevolent support to members of your church? I would have said, of course we do. We provide diaper assistance. We provide housing assistance. We provide transportation assistance. Those are concrete supports in time of need. I don't call them that in my church, but it doesn't mean I don't do it. Yeah. And this is what I want to help social scientists understand and religious practitioners understand. We're about the same thing. Safe, stable, nurturing families in the pews. How do we work together to get them? And let's not let the language barrier divert us from working together. I love well, that. I think I was just going to build on that, like another, you know, way to support children is having community involvement. And like Absolutely. you said, whether that is their religious support, whether it's their community, you know, activities, but being able to belong to some supportive community um, is really what we can do to help help children. And that's really what that 19 ad, developmental asset is saying that, it, you know, any child involved in this religious activity, it presumes that the religious activity is positive, it's congregative, it, it builds relationships, it has the ability, all of that is involved, I think, in a healthy religious experience. Now that we know they're unhealthy religious experiences. <laughs> yeah. I want to, I want to piggyback on a couple of things that uh, y'all mentioned. Um, one of them is this this idea of concrete support. And just to give people who might be listening a couple of examples of, of ways that you can provide concrete support to uh, kids and families who may be impacted by abuse. One of them is something called Care Portal, which is uh, available nationally in, in most states where um, uh, you're at, either as an individual or as a faith leader or as a faith community, you'd be able to uh, see what some needs are for kids and families that are involved with human services in some way and then help contribute to those needs. And another one that's specific here in Minnesota, but can be uh, a model. I know that there's a similar model in Charleston, South Carolina. There used to be one in Connecticut, though I'm not certain if it's still there. There used to be one in Texas, though I'm not certain if, certain if it's still there. Um, but it's a program here in Minnesota called Care in Action Minnesota, um, where there are partnerships that are developed between faith communities and child protection workers. And then when there are needs on that worker's case that they can't meet, they contact a partnering faith community who then helps meet that need. Um, needs have been help moving, help with rent, uh, even so far as throwing a baby shower for a mom transitioning out of foster care. And so really there are some incredible options out there. And this does something else. It allows you to provide that concrete support, but every time you do, if you make sure your faith community knows you're doing that, your faith community starts talking and then they start talking about abuse and then they start talking about how can we safeguard kids how can we support families and more and more it becomes part of just the dna and the culture of your church as you do these things and you end up helping kids and families and you end up changing your church into a church who truly reflects the heart of god towards kids who may have been hurt towards families that may be hurting as well the other thing that I also really want to piggyback on, uh, Daryl, the way that you described as a pastor, I realized I needed to get some additional information. And so I went and I studied marriage and family therapy. I love, I, I love that you described that and that you realized, okay, there was an area that I, maybe my seminary didn't train me about. I mean, we've got to face it. Seminaries, really need to do a better job in addressing abuse. They, yeah, they yeah. do. 
Um, and many pastors out there will not have had, for example, the, the training that you've had, will not have um, been through keeping faith or some other type of training that you can um, that you can go through. And in those situations, it's really, really important that we have good, strong collaboration, that faith leaders and mental health leaders and healthcare leaders are working together to care for the whole child, the whole family, that we're not going outside of our skill and our competency, but at the same time, we're not saying, oh, I'm a pastor. You need to go see a therapist for trauma. No, as a pastor, you need to be involved in that person's life. But you also recognize there are other people that need to be here with me. Yeah. Yeah. So um, just real quick, we're just about to the Q&A time, but can you help us understand just real quick, um, if as a faith leader, as a friend, as a neighbor, I'm concerned that a child is being abused. What do I do? I'll take a first stab, and, and I'm sure Rebecca and Shelley will, 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 will follow up. You know, there's something called mandatory reporting, and and, and every teacher is a mandatory reporter. Um, and let me just translate that into faith talk. If you are a Sunday school teacher, guess what? You're a mandatory reporter. If you are a youth worker in the Shiloh Baptist Church, guess what? You are a mandatory reporter. So we often make a dissection that mandatory reporting is kind of in the secular world. And somehow every youth worker in every house of worship in America and around the world needs to be trained on how what Rebecca and Shelley just mentioned, how to recognize the signs. Yeah. Because to do anything less is to be complicit in the abuse of that child. And so I want to just speak to this from the faith perspective. If you're working with youth in your house of worship, you need to be trained. And if you have not yet been trained, organizations like Grace, they do a great job. You got the resources there to call Grace. Um, there are colleagues of Peter and, and mine, like Victor Veith. He does training for clergy on um, this very nature, this very aspect. There are organizations like the Dove's Nest, um, a Mennonite-based organization that does training. There, there, is, there are training opportunities for you clergy. Doesn't involve a three-year seminary degree again. Doesn't involve a doctoral level degree. You don't have to go back to school. It, we can target the training on the policies of understanding risk factors and how to recognize them and understanding promotive protective factors, how to accentuate them, and then tell your congregants what to do in these situations. We can role play so that there's no guessing in this, but every youth worker in every house of worship needs to be trained. Yeah. Rebecca, yeah. Shelley, other thoughts? Yeah. Um... Well, I was just going to, I mean, agreed, right? So um, mandatory reporting is so important and it's something I agree that everybody needs to be trained on. I think when you're talking about um, being in a role where maybe you're not a mandatory reporter, you're maybe a friend or a neighbor, I think then we need to look at it as ethically, what do we need to do? And I think the most important thing to remember is that, um, it is up to us to make sure that kids are safe yeah. and to give them a voice and to give them an opportunity. And so we really need to make those mandatory reports, even when we're not necessarily legally mandated to do it, but we are ethically mm -hmm. mandated to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I encourage everybody to know how to make a report um, in their community. The other thing I want to say is that the good news with all of this, it's a hard topic to be talking about, but the good news is that there are so many things out there that can help mitigate all of these risk factors that we've talked about today. There's so many therapeutic um, avenues that families can take, resources and services and things that people can do in our communities to recover and heal and stop this um, intergenerational cycle of, of violence and, and abuse and trauma exposure. So when we make those reports, we're giving kids and families the opportunities 
that they need to get the help to heal and recover. Yeah. Every, every state and every jurisdiction has a 1-800 number, I'm sure, your county, your state, your municipality. So um, a key start is knowing who to call. Um, you know, one of my high school teachers said, Armstrong, intelligence is not always knowing the answer, it's knowing where to find the answer. Yep, absolutely. All right, well, this has been really informative. Uh, I appreciate it. It's helped us to have a better understanding of what is physical abuse, emotional and psychological abuse. Um, it's helped us understand how that impacts a person. It's helped us understand what we can do. I want us to take a few minutes now to, to look at some of the questions that have come in. Um, we may not get to all of the questions. If we do not get to the questions, please, uh, please feel free to email uh, me at Pete at netgrace.org if we did not get to your question and I'll share your question uh, among the panelists then we will uh, get back to you with an answer. Again, that's Pete at netgrace.org. And so um, the first question, uh, does physical abuse just automatically cause emotional and psychological abuse? I mean, I think that some could argue yes, <laughs> and I certainly would be would be one of those. I think that um, when another loving, trusting, caring adult uses any kind of physical means on a child, I think that that is going to impact their mental health and their psychological sort of framework. Um, so I, I would certainly agree that that is likely. I think. Um, you know, when you start talking about state statute and, and kind of what happens with child protection or law enforcement when these kinds of things come up, that feels a little bit like a different story because they have very close um, or clear sort of guidelines that they have to go and use. Um, but when you're just sort of talking about what those definitions mean, um, I certainly would agree that that physical abuse can cause mental injury as well. And, and I would just argue um, there's something called vicarious trauma right? There's secondary trauma, uh, just like there's second secondhand smoke. Um, we should be clear that even witnessing the physical assault of another human being can be psychological injurious to the person witnessing. And so absolutely, I think physical abuse can, um, by extraction, um, be also uh, in the realm of emotional and, and psychological abuse. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think at minimum, it's it's um, diminishing the child's you know self worth and their self confidence. That's right. Yeah. And then the co occurrence, the co occurrence of domestic violence and child abuse. Right. We often decouple, but often those things co occur. Children who are in homes where there's intimate partner domestic violence. I have, stand a high likelihood of also being exposed to physical abuse and psychological abuse themselves. Yeah, yeah. We have some really good questions that I'm afraid that we're not going to get to. Um, please do uh, email me those questions. Um, uh, I, I just wanna recognize them, mention them just so that people are aware. These are really good questions. What about a situation where a family has split um, there may, there may not have been some abuse that occurred. Uh, when is it good to look at reunification in those situations? Are there groups that help with reunification? Uh, are there groups that would do that through a, a Christian lens? What helps us know when it's safe, not safe um, uh, to bring uh, a family back together? We're not gonna be able to get to that question today, but that's one of those, those questions that was out there. And then also, um, physical abuse that happens at the church. Um, if somebody at the church is physically abusing a child to the point where that child has an injury that occurred at the church, um, how do we respond then? And while we don't have a chance to do a deep dive into that specific question, I do want to point out that if somebody, uh, an adult, is hitting a child uh, at the church to the point where that child is receiving an injury, that would be a reportable crime most likely. 
Um, and so you would absolutely want to report that a child was hit to the point of injury to, to law enforcement or child protection. Um, but if you want to send me that question, we'll do a deeper dive into that as well. But I just did also want to just specify um, uh, that if that child's being hit to the point of injury, that that is a report to law enforcement. Um, Can I just say too, yeah. um, real briefly, I, um, you know, there are, you know, this, this sort of issue of reunification. Children who are who do experience abuse, physical abuse and mental abuse, I just wanna say that they still love their parent and their caregiver. And that doesn't change that um, oftentimes, kind of depending on where it falls and sort of that continuum of abuse. But, you know, we do have to recognize that there are very good people who do bad things. Um, and that we are also talking about um, adults who as children, experienced their own maltreatment and abuse and trauma and that's all they know and so they grow up and they do the same thing with their child and so I do think it is important to give some grace and understanding and an opportunity for them also to make change and heal and figure out how they can continue to parent in a better capacity for themselves and their child. Well said, Rebecca. You know, I watched my mom snort cocaine and shoot heroin with her boyfriend, the same boyfriend that didn't put my two-year-old brother in the tub of scalding hot water and caused us to be removed. I still want to go back and be with my mom, right? Because kids don't understand um, the complexity of what we're talking about. And so some of this is so basic, human relationships, bonding, nurturing, attachment are all issues that feed the soul as the physical food feeds the body, you know, friends at Hope, um, Bob Sagey, Dr. Bob Sagey and, and Dr. Allison Stevens um, doing great work around, you know, promoting the, the positive childhood experiences. Um, and so another resource just to add into this mix, you know, Google Hope and, 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 and you'll find a great wealth of resources. Great. Well, thank you again, Rebecca and Shelly and Daryl for joining us today. Uh, your your words of wisdom, your your insight and sharing personal experiences has just been invaluable. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us today and listening. You are a powerful force for protecting kids. You're a powerful force for helping families. Thank you for taking the time to listen and thank you for all that you do. Please check us out on the internet. You can find us at www.netgrace.org. Please also join us in January when we talk about poly victimization, that um, uh, experiencing of more than one form of abuse, uh, experiencing perhaps physical and sexual, physical and emotional at the same time. And what does that mean uh, practically for us? Also, please know that this, uh, uh, Grace Live Conversation has been recorded and uh, give us a couple of days and it'll be up on our YouTube page. So please check out our YouTube page where you can also find all of our past Grace Live Conversations covering a wide range of topics. Hey, Thank you again. Merry Christmas. Um, and we hope to see you again at our future Grace Live Conversations. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.